and then I've been working with this new uh, punk band I've done some recordings for named Toxy and you know I'm, I'm just now really kind of getting uh, indulged I guess in the in the punk scene or whatever and some of that stuff is really cool some of it sounds you know it reminds me of music you know 40 50 years ago because it's uh it's not a lot of uh it's more into the it, it's real creative you know so yeah so those are some of the bands there's probably some other people i can't think of right now but right off the top those <laughs> Uh, Willie Mitchell uh, redesigned the studio in the 70s and... Um, Actually in the 60s. Oh, in the 60s. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. 60s. And uh, created, you know, like the high sound, essentially. Um, so could you describe what that sound is exactly? Uh, that sound is... It's, it's like intimate. Um, the story with that is that he, he recorded his first record here, I think, in 59. And... Uh, he never liked the way his records uh, sounded and the engineer at the time wouldn't you know my dad was like man can I engineer he was like no you can't engineer um, so you know my dad complained for about four or five years that you couldn't tell the difference between any of the different artists on high records Ace Cannon, Bill Black, Willie Mitchell you know, Pop was just like, man, all the records sound the same. You don't know who you're listening to. And um, I think it was about 65, uh, 66 when um, he finally had sold enough records to buy out the engineer. And when he did that, he started uh, experimenting with the room and, you know, putting burlap up and stuff like that to make his records sound different than the other records and records on the radio. And he got it right, he got it like he wanted it in 69, which was the, uh, Tired of Being Alone was like the first record cut with that format. And it just, um, his records, you know, it, the sound of the studio just became intimate because other studios had more of a live, a reverb type of sound. Um, people were starting to put wood and stuff in studios and he like went 180 the other direction and was you know killing reflections and stuff and so when you listen to his record and also some of the equipment too so his sound was like more intimate and then the bass it just his records just had more low end uh, than if you compare them to Motown and Stax and other, you know, R&B records of, of the time. Those records had more bottom. Some of it was because of the room. Some of it was um, because of the equipment too. He, when 8-track tape recorders came out, they were all solid state. And I think that was like 68 when those came out. And, you know, he had one for about a week and hated it because uh, he was used to tube stuff. So somebody in Texas made him a tube eight track machine, which is that big monster in the corner. Um, and, you know, to the nature of tube gear is that it's warmer and fuzzier. So that also gave his records more bass. So, uh, uh, in the 60s and the 70s, um, you had studios, you know, were starting to close, like Sun and Stacks. Um, so, how, in your opinion, how does Royal manage to escape the same fate? Man, well, it, yeah, when it's like Sun had its run in the 50s and Stacks in the 60s, and then Royal took over the torch in the 70s. Um, you know, it's just, my dad was, uh, his perseverance, I guess. Uh, he never, 
you know, music was changed. Music started changing about '76, I think. '76, '77, disco was coming in. People weren't really into soul music anymore. Um, and you know, my dad he tried to um, adapt and stay with the, you know, with the time and still trying to do his stuff. Uh, he just, uh, you know, uh, under normal circumstances, people probably would have closed the place, business, you know, but uh, he, he was just, uh, he wasn't a quitter. And uh, so we did some, you know, we made it, we did some cool, uh, some cool stuff in the 80s. People would, people would still call looking for the Memphis Sound every now and then. Um, so we just, you know, he was real dedicated to making sure the door stayed open. And he always told me, it's like, man, don't turn this place into a museum. 